Hi friends. Well, it's been a while since we just sat down and had a talk about what's on my mind today. And I was just about to sit down and do that when this happened. I thought I heard rain, but it's not raining. Please enjoy my stories or whatever else might be on my mind today. Sounds like it's raining, but it's not raining. Let me run through the sprinkler. Ooh. I have water coming off of the roof. The Tanaka is overflowing. Why is that? Valve is stuck. And now that I've spilled some water down here, seems I have an ant problem. There's an, off my foot, there's an ant problem, an ant nest underneath my Tanaka, which has nothing to do with what the problem was, but another thing to take care of. Okay, so I put my ant powder down there. We'll see if uh, it makes any difference in a few days. I'll come up here and throw some water up in there and see if they start coming out again. Uh, don't know if you ever knew I could actually go up in the top of my tower. It's uh, 31 feet to the ground. Thinking about building a greenhouse up here on that level, which is above the living room. Well, the wind came up, so I'm doing a voiceover for you because the wind noise was terrible in my phone. Uh, that canopy used to be out there by the well, and I parked my ATV under it. I moved it over here in the garden because this time of year, the sun is real brutal on the garden, so I'm thinking about getting some shade cloth and covering that up to give the garden a little shade. It might help it grow better here in the summertime. I've got some butternut squash I planted over there. It's doing really well. And here I have some acorn squash that's almost getting big enough to harvest. We cleaned out this cactus garden over here in the corner and Lynn planted a bunch of flowers that have come up two, three inches already and watering it every night. Going to be a beautiful flower garden there real soon. Can't wait for the rains to start to water the grass. So what really happened up there? Well, let's back up a couple of weeks to an ad in the paper. It's not an ad, an article. Right here, uh, the Guadalajara Reporter, if you're new to the channel or new to Mexico, the Guadalajara Reporter is an English language newspaper that comes out on Fridays here at Lakeside. Uh, they also have a Porta Vallarta issue. But the headline uh, for May 13, 7 to 13 was Dengue Prevention Campaigns Underway. Yes, they came to my house uh, a couple of weeks ago and said, we'd like to put a thing in your Tanaco, that's the big black tank on the roof. So I agreed to let them do that because, as you well know, mosquitoes are the most dangerous animal in the world. Look it up. 
Anyway, I agreed to let them do that. And this is what they put in there. A used uh, water bottle and a little sack of chemicals. And it's not a, it, it, it just has little pinholes stuck in the little plastic bag to let the chemicals out. Anyway, this is their dengue prevention thing for Tanakos. Well, what happened was that this thing got wedged between the float that comes up and stops the water. It was up on top, wedged up against the side of the Tanako. And uh, didn't let the valve close, so I'm getting water running off the roof because the Tanako is overflowing. Uh, what's on my mind today? Well, to begin with, I was going to tell you about my car. My BMW has a coolant leak in the back of the engine. And I have determined what the problem is, but I cannot get my hands to it. It's, uh, it's a job that requires a, a blind uncoupling of a couple of bolts and two hose clamps. And I would normally not worry about this. I'd just take it to my favorite mechanic, Pablo. Uh, while we were gone for six months, Pablo disappeared. His shop is closed. Uh, there are no more cars in the lot where they're waiting to be fixed, and I can't locate Pablo, my mechanic, so I'm looking for a new one. If any of you are uh, here at Lakeside and know of a good BMW mechanic you could recommend that isn't going to keep my car for a month and tell me he hasn't gotten to it yet, uh, let me know in the comments below. Thank you. Well, what else is on my mind today? Uh, a few videos ago, I alluded to the fact that uh, I was working on a new project. And um, that project, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it because uh, it's uh, an ongoing process which may or may not uh, take place. It's a project that my son and I are working on, buying some property in Arizona. So how does that relate to uh, retiring and living in Mexico, which is why you're here listening to me? Because the stories I'm going to tell you bring to mind the differences between trying to do something in the United States and trying to do something <laughs> in Mexico with regard to the cost of living, the cost of doing business, the amount of government oversight, and uh, there are lessons to be learned here. I'm learning them um, the difficult way. I'm not going to say the hard way because it's not my first rodeo with going through building code regulations and building code departments. Anyway, we're trying to buy this property. And it starts out that uh, the realtor says this is where the property line is and there are a couple of old buildings on the property that we have determined may very well have significant historical um, value to the history of Arizona. Um, anyway, uh, uh, some famous people um, are involved in the history there and I'm not going to tell you the history because we haven't bought the property yet and I think we have a lead on something of significant historical value but turns out that a four-bedroom adobe house <laughs> of about 2,500 square feet which is if you didn't have any government regulations, you could just fix it up and it would be a wonderful property, a wonderful house to live in with 18-inch thick adobe walls that have been standing there since 1905. The roof needs some help, probably some structural help. Um, the floor is uh, concreted long after the adobe floor. It's, it's in my opinion 
would be a great house to live in with regard to our factors of the insulation of the walls, the fact that uh, it's at 5,200 square feet, which mitigates the hot temperatures of the desert. It's in a wonderful area surrounded by national forest with no neighbor within two miles. It's just a fantastic opportunity. However, I've spent the last three weeks studying county regulations with regard to building codes, uh, living on the property in an RV while um, working on the property, um, FEMA floodplain maps, county designated riparian areas, it's become, I don't want to say it's a nightmare, but I want to say it's a puzzle that I've been challenged to solve. I would much rather work on these things uh, mentally and emotionally than sit down and do a jigsaw puzzle or work a Sudoku <laughs> or play free cell on my uh, iPad. Uh, it's a challenge that I'm not only up to, but frankly experienced in. And again, how does that relate to retiring and living in Mexico, looking at uh, building codes and uh, problems with government regulations in Arizona? Well, it relates because I've been through that process uh, innumerable times in uh, the United States, and I've been through that process also in Mexico. In Mexico, when I built uh, this living room that you see to join two separate properties, there were uh, permits required. And I got those permits from the powers that be in Chapala. Chapala is like the county seat of um, um, of the area that I live in. And even though I don't live in the town or the city of Chapala, the city of Ahihik is regulated by that as being the county, uh, the county seat. Those aren't the Mexican terms for that, but they're the American terms for the same things. Anyway, yes, I did get a permit. It was required to get a permit. I had a couple of inspections which uh, presented no additional problems. The process was uh, pleasurable, fairly easy, and not too expensive. Contrast that with government, both county, city, state, and federal in the United States of America. Uh, I don't want this to turn into a rant, but let me start with the concept that it is the nature of governments to make more and more and more rules, laws, regulations. Um, they get together in these big bodies called legislatures. And what they do is they spend six to eight months making up new rules, making up more rules, tweaking the rules they already have. They add rules and they add rules and they add rules and they add rules and extremely rarely do they ever rescind a rule. There are rules governing things that happened in the United States of America that were written in the 1800s. I'm talking about building codes. Anyway, a whole lot of them were changed with a revision of the a uniform building code, and I believe, 2012. Hi, Lynn. Hi, Jerry. What you doing? Uh, you do know that the thing up on the roof went again? Yep, I've already addressed that. I've already fixed it. I've already found the problem, and I've already talked about it to my friends. Oh, well. But, but thank you for letting me know. Did you hear it raining? Well. Did you hear it sound like it was raining? No, I was Oh, you were asleep, yeah. Anyway, it's all wet on the patio? Yes, it the is. The kitchen patio? Uh, 
it'll dry up like everything else else does when you have tile floors. Okay. Feel free to mop it a little if you like. I did all the mopping I can do today. Go sit down and relax. Okay. Anyway, building codes and the contrast between the United States and Mexico. Um, I'm not going to go into the building codes in Mexico. They have some, but they're not stringent. They're not invasive. They're not expensive to deal with. Uh, by contrast, I can tell you a couple of stories. The name of my channel is JC Travel Stories, so let's travel back in time a little bit. Let's see, I have a number of these stories, but let's talk about this one. Um, it came to pass that uh, Lynn and I decided to invest in a property a couple of doors down the street from where we lived in Portland, Oregon. Uh, it wasn't a historical property. I've, I've owned two historical properties. One of them in uh, downtown Portland in the Pearl District that was an 8-plex when I bought it and a 9-plex when I sold it. And going through all of the regulations of a historical property uh, are not easy, but there are advantages to having it declared as such because it gives you tax breaks, etc., etc. But today we want to talk about... Um, building codes. So we find this house and it's it's been foreclosed. So it's owned by a bank. I'm in Portland, Oregon, but it's owned by a bank in Florida. And we find out that there are, I believe if I remember correctly, it was 19 code violations against the property, which I was willing to deal with and had some experience dealing with. Um, the, and, and most of them didn't seem significant, but one of them was a structural um, code violation, uh, or at least the city said so. And what happened was that it had previously been owned uh, by a high school shop teacher who built a fourth bedroom on the second floor uh, in a dormer. He built the dormer. The, f the flooring above part of the living room and that used to be a flat roof and a dormer with a peaked roof above that uh, new fourth bedroom. And he did get permits for it, but he never finalized them. So it falls upon me to finalize <laughs> the building permit. So I get the code inspector out there, the building inspector, and he comes out and uh, we get a step ladder up in the hallway of the upstairs and there's an access place to look up in the attic and he crawls up the step ladder and uh, now all I can see is because he's gone up through this this uh, crawlway all I can see is him from the knees down and I hear uh oh <laughs> and he comes down the ladder and he says uh, we're going to have to have an engineering report about that 2 by 12 ridge board and the fact that it's held up by uh, 4 by 6s on each end and I can't see what supports the 4 by 6s holding up the 2 by 12 at the ridge. Okay. A few days later, I've got an engineer out there who goes up the stepladder, and now, again, I can only see him from the knees down, and I hear, uh-oh. And he comes down, and he says, that ridge board, 2 by 12, supported by the 4 by 6s on each end, with about a 30-foot span, um, excuse me, it was about a 12-foot span. He said, I can't see where those four by sixes go, so you're going to have to tear the wall apart here and maybe even down on the first floor in order to show me uh, how those are structurally supported. I said, okay, fine, I can tear the wall apart. Um, give me a quote on 
what it's going to cost for you to come back and write an engineering report. A couple of days pass and I get this quote of, I, I remember it was like six or eight hundred dollars for him to write up a piece of paper. And I decide to shop around for a different engineer. So I get a different engineer out there. And the same thing. I'm looking at his legs. Can't see him from the knees up. And I hear again, uh-oh. But in the meantime, I've done my research. I go in my house two doors away. And I've got a 30-foot span from one side to the other. And the ridge board, that's up here at the top of the roof on the inside, is a 1x6. It's not a 2x12. It's a 1x6. And there's no supports. I've got windows on each side. Maybe the windows are supported because there's a header in there. I don't know. But anyway, it's a 1x6. 1 inch by 6 inches, not a 2x12. So I do some research and I figure out, now this is 20 years ago and I don't remember, but the difference between platform construction and pole, pole support construction. I'm not an architect and I'm an engineer, but I know how to learn something. So I get another guy to come out there. He's an architect now. So I figured, well, I'm going to go from engineer to architect and see if that makes any difference. So I get an architect out there, and once again, looking at his knees, I hear, uh-oh. And I say to him, hey, come down here, let's have a talk about this. I said, first of all, those 4x6s are in fact supporting the 2x12, but that 2x12 is not holding up the roof. The only thing a ridge board does is it keeps the rafters from passing each other. That's platform construction. I might be wrong about that term. Anyway, that's all that little ridge board does is it keeps it. It don't need a 2x12 up there. You need a 1x6 and it doesn't need to be supported at all. All it does is keep the two before the, 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 the rafters from passing. And he looks at it and he says, you're absolutely right. He said, who built this? I said, well, some high school shop teacher. He says, well, he didn't need to put all that lumber up there. He said, do you have a ladder that we can go up on the roof? I said, yeah. He says, okay, let's go up on the roof. We're up on the roof, and he says, one of the things that an architect or a structural engineer has to determine is the snow load. He said, let's jump up and down. We'll jump up and down on the roof. And he says, I'll pass this. <laughs> and he writes me a report, which gets rid of the building code violation because I can finalize the permit. Uh, anyway, we have found so many difficulties with the setbacks of the buildings. The fact that we have a riparian area, riparian, by the way, means that it's a waterway. There hasn't been any water through there. The house was built in 1905, and there's absolutely no indication that water's ever been anywhere near the building. There's another draw, I call it, valley. It's not a valley. It's not that big. It's like this big going down past another part of the house, and there's a 25-foot setback for that. If the water cubic feet per uh, second is this much, and it's 100, it's this much, and it's 500, it's more. And what, so we make arrangements to have a $2,700 study done for a floodplain erosion hazard engineer's report. We haven't, we haven't absolutely decided that yet, but that's where we're at. Anyway, it just makes me appreciate <laughs> what a pleasure it is building something or doing business or dealing with the powers that be in Mexico. It gets back to all of those things I've said in videos before about if you walk down the sidewalk in Chapala and you step in a hole and break your leg, whose fault is it?
It's not the city's fault, and it's not the business that you're in front of's fault. It's your fault. This isn't a nanny state like the USA. Uh, I just, um, like I said, I don't want to turn this into a rant, but I guarantee you, doing something in Mexico is a pleasure with regard to government regulation. Okay, enough of that rant. Speaking of regulation, there's another thing going on here that I just found out about a few days ago. Uh, let me refer to my iPad here. Um, headline in the thing I'm reading is, Tax Reform, this is in Mexico now, requires expats to obtain taxpayer registration by July 1st. Temporary and permanent residents age 18 or over or anyone with a CURP identity number, that's a government ID number, Lynn and I both have them, Anyone with a CURP identity number must have an RFC number by July 1st, whether they earn income in Mexico or not. It's a tax ID number for people in Mexico. We don't have that. Um, sounds like we're going to have to get it. Not prepared to do a video on that, but I'll do some research on it with regard to how you get it and why you need it. Um, I'll see if I can put that together for you. There may be other videos out there already about that. There's a um, two expats in Mexico. I think that's the name of the YouTube channel. Check it out. I think he did a video about it. Uh, anyway, thanks for being with me today. Hey, if you like me, give me one of those thumbs up. And please subscribe and hit that little bell so you know when I post next. Please share me with your friends on social media. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed what was on my mind today.